parents, speaking with the families just a moment ago, someone remarked, it's not often that someone plays their own funeral, and uh, how, how beautiful that was. Uh, haven't had the chance to meet you before. My name is Ryan Linkus. I'm the pastor here at First Baptist Williams, and I had the privilege of knowing Marilyn for the past two years. Um, and I know that as I look across the room, uh, there's people, uh, again, I, I can imagine how you all know her, but there's so many different ways in which the people in this room have been connected to Marilyn through the years, through the decades. Uh, and I know that it's such a blessing to the family uh, to see you here uh, to honor her memory. Uh, we've gathered today to have a funeral for and to celebrate the life of Marilyn Ingram. I always say whenever we gather for a funeral, we gather to do three things. And it's important that we do all three of these things today. The first thing that we have gathered to do today is to remember. I've already mentioned that, again, we all knew Marilyn in a very specific way. And if you knew her, whatever way you knew her, it was a wonderful way. And so we want to bring our memories now and thank God for the memories that we have. The second thing we've gathered to do today is to mourn. And the reality is, is that we are here today because there has been a death. And the Bible speaks of death as the greatest enemy. And so we have lost someone, at least for a little while. And we want to acknowledge that before God, to grieve, but to grieve with hope. And the third thing that we gather to do at a funeral, and we can do this because Marilyn was a Christian who had placed her faith in Jesus Christ. We gather today to rejoice because we know where Marilyn is. Her trial, her struggle that she endured, especially over the last year, she's run her course. She ran with endurance. And she's already heard the words that we long to hear. Well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant. And so I hope today, as we do think about the fact that this is a celebration of life, that that's, we've come to do all of those things, to mourn, to remember, but also to rejoice. As we prepare today, I wanted to read from Psalm 46, if you would hear this word from the Lord. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, for we will not fear, though the earth give way Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation to the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Would you please bow your head with me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we have gathered now this sacred hour to remember the life of your beloved servant, Marilyn, God, we pray that you, who were her God, who were her God and God, you are our God, you would be with us to comfort us. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would hover on this place, on this sanctuary, in the congregation over the next hour so that we know that we are standing on holy ground, experiencing a holy moment together. God, I pray that you, that wherever our hearts might be taken over the next hour to the highest highs or the lowest lows, we know that your son, Jesus Christ, is there with us and for us because of his death upon the cross and his resurrection from the grave. God, would you carry us now this hour? We pray this in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. And we know Marilyn loved music. It was a, a passion of hers. She loved to hear the choir and she loved to hear the congregation. And these were two of her absolute favorites. Katrina said, I don't know what to pick out because she liked everything. So we're going to do two of the favorites that I know of. And I hope you'll sing along with us, all right? There is sunshine in my soul today because we rejoice, all right?
you sing. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises. Jesus is singing his praises, singing his praises. Jesus is mine. Amen. And one day we shall see Jesus. Y'all gonna have to bear with me on this, okay? I want to start out by thanking a few folks, um, our church family, not just up here in this choir, but out there as well. Um, Nikki has turned up, t- 
termed us Williamites, and um, there's no people on earth like the Williamites here at Williams. Um, our church family here at Williams has been bringing food to mom and dad for several months, a um, couple times a week. And I told Ryan, you know, everybody wants to serve. We're servers here at Williams. And, you know, there's not a lot people could do. They Praying, we were already doing that. Um, visiting, we were already doing that. Calling, checking on us, you know, already doing that. Um, but one way people could help was um, they would come by and bring food. And they were able to visit with us and with mom at that time. Um, but yeah, we here at Williams, we're servers. We love serving others. Um, and so just like today, many people have helped put together the service. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Mom loved Williams, and she loved every one of you, and I know that you all loved her. Um, I know that I will, um, like I said, forget names, so I'm not even going to try. So thank you, Williamites, uh, for being here for us. Uh, we couldn't have made it through this without you guys. During this time, it's easy to, I think, dwell on negative things. Um, I'm kind of a pessimist. Um, But I found myself counting my blessings, something that I had not done in a while. And as mom was being sick, I was thinking about all the things to be thankful for, be blessed. We're blessed. And um, one of those things that I'm truly blessed for today our friends and families, um, not just our church friends, but our cl- you know close um, friends and families. Um, they've called, they've texted, they've called and said, "Hey, you need to go get Mexican food. Um, you, do you need a minute out?" And um, that means the world to me. I am so blessed with my friends and family. Um, I have a good support group, and I can't thank them enough. Um, especially for being here today. Many of them have walked in, and I just lost it, so uh, they know who they are. Uh, I also want to thank Carrie, Julie, and Cindy. Mom had three caregivers, and um, gosh, I'd, we asked around. It was hard, you know, it was to find folks that would sit. Um, and here again, I'm blessed because I feel like God led these women to us. Um, they fit right in with all of our crazy. And they were just fantastic with mom. And um, they even put up with dad. So, <laughs> um, but we had we would not have made it uh, through this without them. And I can't remember if I said Carrie, Julie, and Cindy. We love y'all. Thank you. Um, she's going to be mad that I'm doing this. And I'm probably going to have to read this part word for word. But um, I want to say a big thank you to my sister-in-law, Donna. She has been a rock through all of this. Uh, Me, Walt, and Dad wouldn't have made it without her. At the beginning, she was sitting and staying with Mom and helping out, and um, I've had lots of conversations with her. Um, But yeah, I wouldn't have made it through it without her guidance. And I want her to know that I can never repay her for all that you've done. I know you did it because that is the person that you are, but I truly do mean it. Love you, and I will never forget that. So, love you. Um, It's been hard. Uh, You know, how do you begin talking about the greatest woman you ever knew? (laughs) I was blessed. God gave me mom. There was no one else I would have wanted to be my mom. I know that no one is perfect, but Marilyn Ingram was pretty dang close. Um, Mom was a teacher. She taught kindergarten for the majority of her professional career, and she said, she said this on multiple occasions, she always felt blessed to be a kindergarten teacher. She felt that it was the most important year because she helped lay the foundation for a young life. Uh, She took pride in being a teacher. After retirement, Mom was a daycare director at the Children's House in Jacksonville and then here at FBC Williams. Over the last few days, many have reached out or posted on social media about Miss Ingram or Miss Marilyn as their teacher. It amazes me that so many remember her as their kindergarten or daycare teacher. I think that in itself is a testament to the person she was. She touched many lives and little lives in that role. Mom loved music. 
she would hate that I told everyone this, but she even knows who Kid Rock is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I remember my first concert. I was seven years old. It was Rick Springfield and Corey Hart with my Aunt Paula. Paula, do you remember this one? Aunt Paula was there. She was seven months, pre- eight months pregnant with Kaylee. Um, over the years, uh, Mom took me and walked to many concerts. I believe it was Mom that instilled the le- love of music in us. Both Walt and I read music, have sung or played in groups. Um, I'm blessed to be part of this group back here. Um, so, yeah. Mom was the pianist here at Williams. We said 52, 54, 50 plus years. It was a long time. Uh, But she played countless cantatas and taught and led the children's choir. In April, the church held the most perfect celebration for all of her years of service. She enjoyed being part of this church family and loved playing the piano. The piano music you heard playing before the service were clips of mom playing the offertory during those church services. So thank you guys for putting that together. I really appreciate it. Uh, When I sat down to write for this today, I remembered reading something um, on grief. Um, Like I said, mom's been sick, you know, for about 10 good months. And um, with someone once told me, I actually think it was Donna Thomas, you know, somebody with Alzheimer's, you don't just lose them once, you lose them over and over. And so I'd kind of grieved for mom a little bit early on. And um, so when I sat down to write this, I remembered reading something about grief. I'm not for sure who wrote it um, or what even the title was, but it starts out as one day. So I'm going to read a little bit of snippet, and this is, like I said, words of someone else, and then a little bit from me. One day your mom won't call you anymore, and you'll find yourself reaching for the phone, waiting for a ringtone that never comes. It's in that silence that you realize how her voice was the soundtrack of your life guiding you through every joy, every heartbreak, every mundane moment in between. Mom will always play a part in the soundtrack of my life. Not just my life, but in everyone she touched. I'm not going to lie. It's going to be hard, and some days are just going to (laughs) suck. You see, I don't know what life looks like without my mom. I'm 47, and she has been there for all 47 She's been that constant my whole life. One day, the holidays won't be the same. You'll set the table with her favorite dishes, try to recreate the warmth that she brought with her laughter and stories, but the food will taste different, not because of the recipe, but because of the love that used to fill the room. All the days, just not the holidays, will be different. I don't think I will fully understand to what extent until a few months have passed. Every day is going to feel a little different for a while, but we're going to be okay. Already we have laughed while looking at pictures for today, and we remember the story behind those pictures. Mom loved to laugh, and when I look back and think about my life, that is one of the things I remember the most about our family, our laughter. We love to have fun, and she wouldn't want that to change. If anything, she would probably want us to do it more. One day, her voice will echo in your mind, but you'll miss the way she said it with that unique mix of wisdom and tenderness that only a mother can offer. You'll long for those late-night talks where her words wrapped around you like a blanket, offering comfort in a world that often feels cold. This is probably going to be the hardest thing for me. I went to mom all the time for her advice. Sometimes I didn't want to ask because I knew what she was going to say, and it wasn't necessarily what I wanted to hear. She always said that it was hard doing the right thing. I know that I will hear her guiding me when I'm going through one of those hard life decisions and think, what would mom do in this situation? And I will hear her voice because she will still be with me and guiding me. One day you'll look at the empty chair where she used to sit and the house will feel too big to quiet. The little things she did, the way she folded your laundry just right, or the scent of her perfume lingering in the hallway will become memories you cling to, fragments of a love that shaped who you are. Mom shaped who we are. She and Dad both encouraged Walt and I to do things that we loved. I loved art. She took me to art lessons. Walt liked to play the guitar. 
and took guitar lessons. He was even allowed to have a band practice in the garage. <laughs> I like to sing. He sent me to voice lessons. Um, what I remember most about mom and what um, I guess stands out about the most of who she was and how she cared about us was she showed up for everything, not just for us, but for the grandkids. If she missed an event for some reason, it was usually something pretty important. She just didn't miss. We were her life, and she made sure that we knew that. That was, again, the same with her grandchildren. She was present. One day, your mom won't call you anymore, and you'll realize that it was never about the calls, but about the connection that ran deeper than words, a bond that time can't erase. And in those moments of stillness, you'll hold on to the lessons she taught you, the strength she passed on, and the love that will forever live in your heart. As I stated before, she isn't physically here, but Granny's going to live in all of us. Um, we have her spirit, and we will hear it. Um, weren't quite done with the service, but I want to, um, to say on behalf of our family, I want to thank everyone for coming today and being with us as we honor her life and legacy. And uh, Donna sent us this the other day, and I just thought it was so fitting. So I want to close with Proverbs 31, 25 through 31. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works Praise her in the gate. Thank you. My heart is pained too deeply for mirth or song. When the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary. cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long night dreary, I know my Savior. When my way is dark with a nameless dread or fear, and as the daylight fades into deep dark shades, does he care enough to be? Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me and my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks? Is it all? 
does he see? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with our grief. When the days are weary, be preaching today from 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 9. So if you will just listen to this for it's God's word to us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, even though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him, Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, Proverbs 31, uh, so fitting that you read that. And I, as I thought about that as it relates to Maryland, I went to the first verse uh, in that kind of section in verse 10. And I I thought about it, translating it this way, an excellent granny who can find. There aren't many women I know who would smile proudly at the title granny, because I think for some people it conjures a picture of an older, frail woman who is not just of a different generation, but of a totally different era. Uh, But, uh, you know, if you you have little kids uh, like mine or you have grandparents that are little, little, you know that grannies are going to make a comeback in a couple decades. But right now... uh, that's how it is. But if, if you knew Marilyn, though, you, there's no way that granny could indicate weakness, is there? No. Anything but strength. She donned granny proudly, owning the title as a badge of honor, and infused it with dignity. One of the things that was remarkable about Marilyn, and I shared this with the family earlier, is if you, if you pigeonholed her into any one of the things that she was known for, um, she was remarkable at it. You know, as a loving family member, right, as a loving wife and mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, sister. She loved her family ferociously, right? She was a matriarch. And again, that would be impressive. If you think of a career in education, at teaching kindergartners, and then after that, running two separate daycares, again, you would think that she is a teacher extraordinaire. If someone began playing church, or sorry, began playing piano at age 15 in the church and played for 52, 54, whatever the 50 is, some odd years, you'd think that she deserves a place in the history books. I'm proud to say that she is in our history book here at Williams. They're all great, but if you roll all of those into one person, that's superhuman. And it's really not fair to the rest of us, okay? <laughs> Right? And let alone that she would do all of these things with humor, with skill, and with love. I think if we were to judge Marilyn by her works, by any human standard, we would give her accolades. But what if we judged her by God's standard? According to Scripture, our, our works don't earn us anything in God's eyes. But what standard does God care about? Well, we know the answer if we read the Bible. It, it's faith. There are many characters in the Bible who have a woefully awful track record 
But nevertheless, we're told in the end, their faith is what gave them standing in God's eyes. How remarkable then, then to have someone like Marilyn who left an impact here on earth and in heaven. I love talking with Marilyn uh, because one of the things that she loved talking the most about was Jesus. Now, as a pastor, I'm supposed to have conversations about God with people, and I enjoy doing that. Sometimes I have to coax that conversation out of people, even in the South where, you know, we have demographically more Christians than any other place in the country. But not with Marilyn. She brought up Christ. She wanted to talk about Jesus. At the age of 11, at least according to our records, that's whenever she professed faith. She and her cousin Paula, they joined the church both in that month in August of 1965. And Marilyn didn't waste any time following Jesus. I think one advantage that Marilyn had in her practice of her faith is the fact that she was a church musician. Uh, her faith was infused by, infused with, augmented and reinforced by the hymns that she played. I'm sure, and if you look over, I don't know if they're still here, there are some hymnals over here that I know are old hymnals, and you can tell the cover's about to fall off of them. And because Marilyn would have played through those so many times. And I think that the advantage she has of playing and knowing those hymns by heart is that it puts her in conversation with centuries of Christian faith and, and expression through music and song. And wow, how blessed we are that she shared that gift with us. But I want to talk a bit more about her faith. I read just a moment ago from 1 Peter chapter 1. It's one of my favorite passages, and it describes the heart and linchpin of salvation. I'm going to read some of the verses again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Right, That living hope, which is Jesus Christ himself through his resurrection from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. What makes believers in Jesus Christ new and renewed is the new birth that we receive from Jesus whenever we believe in him. And we too are born again to a living hope. Again, a hope that is alive because Jesus is alive and he is our hope. Right? Jesus Christ, God's son who came to earth as a human. He lived, he died, and he didn't stay dead, but he conquered death, the greatest and final enemy, by his resurrection from the grave. Now, according to John chapter uh, 14, he's gone to heaven to prepare a place for us that we might dwell with him forever. But what we're told in 1 Peter 1 is that in the present, now, by our faith, we are being guarded. We are being protected by God's power for this salvation that is coming. And in the meantime, we're going to have trials. The Bible is very clear on this. In Jesus Christ, we are not saved to a walk in the park, but to follow him to the cross. And sometimes the crosses that we bear in life are trials that we never would expect. Sometimes we might even think that death upon an actual cross might be easier or preferable to the challenges that we face. As we think about the trial that Marilyn faced over the last year, it was not a trial that any of us, let alone herself, expected. Right To see the strong woman who had used her talents and gifts to love and to serve others for so many decades to see her decline in her memory and ability has not been easy. But as I think about some of the ways in which Marilyn was different in recent months, uh, I think we are still reminded about God's mercy. Right, as Marilyn suffered from Alzheimer's, sometimes if you visited with her, the family knew this, uh, if you had the privilege to visit with her, you know, sometimes things were, were harder. Um, she was a bit more forgetful, um, but also sometimes a little bit more silly, which would bring us chuckles. And she needed a little extra help. It reminds me of a progression that P Jesus himself actually describes to Peter in, in John chapter 21, verse 18. There he tells Peter, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands. Another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. Another way you could describe that is to become a little bit more childlike. And that can seem like if she became a bit more childlike in recent months, is that, is that demeaning? But I think if we remember what 
Jesus Christ told us, becoming more like a child is not a descent. Uh, Remember the scene where Jesus takes a child in the midst of his disciples, he brings him in the middle, puts him on his lap, and what does he say? Truly, truly, I, or, or, sorry, he says, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like a children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Right, we here at Williams, we heard it before the um, service started, but playing one of the most beautiful children's hymns that we as adults should never forget. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. I think that Marilyn's life over the past few months has been a living parable for us. Not just not of weakness, but according to what we're told in the Bible about what weakness is in Jesus' eyes, but a parable of greatness. Enduring a trial, knowing that even as Marilyn's grasp on certain things in this world seemed to loosen, she was grasped even more tightly by a God who knew her and who had saved her. Right, preserved by the Holy Spirit. Right, her riches, according to 1 Peter and what we experienced, were the tested genuineness of her faith even in the midst of of that trial, more perishable than gold. I want to share a, just a memory I have of Marilyn, and it's of the last time that she graced the piano here at First Williams. It was back in January uh, during the offertory. And at that point, she was already beginning to experience some challenges, but we didn't quite know how steep the, the, the hill was that she was going to have to climb. As she played the offertory song that Sunday, Katrina was sitting next to her, And, you know, Marilyn had given a lot of, she probably taught several of you all how to play piano. Whenever a child is learning a song where they have a recital, sometimes the notes are a little heavy, and whenever you miss a note, it can kind of hit, you know, pretty powerfully and, you know, audibly for everyone. As Marilyn played the song that day, she was missing some notes, but it didn't have any of those heavy, hard marks on it. It actually sounded like there was an enchanting beauty to what she was playing as she missed some notes. It sounded like really the beautiful improvisation of a jazz musician who knows the song, has it so inscribed upon their heart that even as some of the capability fades, we hear that truth coming forward. And as I, as I listened to that song yesterday, that the song that it was was one of my favorite ones to hear her play, and it was Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Or sorry, let me go over to the verse. So soul, are you weary and troubled? No, light in the darkness you see. There's light when you look for a Savior. In life more abundant and free, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of the world will grow strangely dim in the light of his beauty and grace. To behold the face, the face of Jesus before the family before we came in here, I talked to them and I said, I, I think today we need to talk about what Marilyn sees now. And it's kind of funny because when they brought her in today, uh, I saw Wren go real quick to the back to Wilson and they said they forgot her glasses. They had to get her glasses so that she could see. <laughs> but whenever I think about what she sees right now, she's seeing what we all long to see that day, right? And the invitation for all of us is that if we repent of our sins and follow Jesus, then one day we too will behold him face to face. Right? First Peter, again, says it so clearly. Though you don't see him, you love him. Though you don't see him right now, you believe and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Marilyn has obtained that outcome, and right now her faith is no longer faith in what is unseen. It's actually beholding Jesus face to face. She sees him. Imagine this, that as she woke up, after her time on earth ended and found herself in the throne room of Jesus, like a child, she probably crawled up into his lap and just stared at him, beholding him. He's there holding her. Unless you become like a child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Here you are, daughter. Here you are. This is your home now. 
don't know about you, but I, I can't wait to join her, right? God has prepared many good blessings for us here on earth. But one day we too will behold that if we come in faith. And so as I wrap up today, I'm going to say a prayer in just a moment. We're going to sing that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And I pray that this is translated in your own hearts as a prayer to God as we believe in him. If you would, please bow your head with me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we might gripe in this world about the many things that we wish we could see or the things we wish we didn't have to see. But the thing that is the greatest, the thing that is the most beautiful is you. Right? The one thing I've asked of the Lord, this one thing that I seek that I would see the glory of the Lord, to behold his face, to gaze upon his beauty in the midst of his temple. God, this is an assurance that we have, even though we'll never experience that fully here on earth. One day, on that day, we will see you as you are. And so, Father, I pray that you would strengthen our faith, just like the faith that Marilyn had. Father, that we would use our giftedness, that we would use our energy to serve and to love others as she did, and that we would trust the Savior that she did. God, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the scripture reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 7 through 18. 
But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend with, from heaven with a cry of command, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Please pray with me. Father, we have heard the word of promise that one day all those who have died in Christ because of his death and resurrection will one day live again. We pray that this hope would remain strong in our heart in the days and the weeks to come. Father, we pray that you would prepare us all now for the road of the rest of our life and for, when it, for the moment when our journey on earth ends. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to provide an abundance of comfort to the family and to all the friends and church members who knew and loved Maryland so well. We love you, and we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. 